Well, since the Darwin Initiative got started, I think I've always regarded myself as being its biggest fan. And some of you might think that you could compete for that title, but uh, I was always impressed by it. I always have been. And uh, I should tell you that when I applied, I thought, maybe I'll get it, who knows. It's an unpaid voluntary position. I want to emphasize that at the start. You never know with these things, but it is. Um, and I applied through a formal process, which is pretty grueling, I have to say. It frightened me. And um, much to my surprise, at the end of that process, was asked to chair the committee. And it had been something I'd really wanted to do because I was beginning to think about retiring from Edinburgh and looking around for the other sorts of things that might uh, keep me out of trouble and occupy my time. So, considering the very illustrious predecessors who chaired the committee, when they actually told me that I'd got the role, I must admit, I, I felt, that's it, I've made it at last. Now, this is the thing I've dreamt of. And um, in a way, it's quite healthy that what happened next did happen, because next I was told that as the chair of the Darwin Expert Committee is, in fact, the DEC chair, the <laughs> DEC chair. So there are a whole group of people who write to me as the DEC chair, and if I'd got a tie or a shirt that looked like that, I'd have been wearing it. I haven't got one yet. So I stand before you as the DEC chair, and... Um, very happy to talk to you about this uh, wonderful thing, the Darwin Initiative. Now, although I'm going to try to give you a kind of personal account and my reactions and my feelings about the Darwin Initiative, I'm going to be relying very heavily on materials that have been produced in DEFRA in the Darwin Initiative Secretariat, and DEFRA still has the overall responsibility for the Darwin Initiative and materials produced by the consultancy company LTS International, who happen to be based in Edinburgh, very conveniently. So, uh, and uh, strange enough, people I've been fortunate to work with in the past. But it's not going to try to be um, an official account or introduction to the initiative, but rather just my personal observations about it and what makes it so wonderful. And I think at this point, I might just ask, if you wouldn't mind, if you've been directly involved in a Darwin Initiative project, would you raise your hand at this point? So quite a few people have, but luckily not 100%, in which case I could leave at this point with nothing to tell you. And is there anybody here who's never heard of it before? Good. <laughs> this is your talk. <laughs> And I'm pleased that there were some people who could answer no to that question because um, I'm still relatively new to it and there will be many people here who know a lot more about it than I do. Well, just in terms of an outline of the things I'm going to, to talk about, um, I think it's an extremely aptly named initiative. Naming it after Darwin was a real stroke of genius, I think. Um, undoubtedly Britain's most renowned biodiversity scientist, as I would call him, and um, whenever you stand up here, he's always kind of looking at you um, over there. So I deliberately put the younger version, this was probably, I don't know if this was when he was in Edinburgh, but it's the younger Darwin. And, um, and also his scribblings from his notebooks, which have become so famous, and I can't help feeling that someday he should have been writing about, one day there will be an initiative, and that's what it would be called. Um, I'm going to touch on all of these topics that you see up there. Just check that I know where the pointer is. Origins and early evolution. I had to call it that, given that it's the Darwin Initiative. Bit corny, but never mind. I'm going to give you some examples that come from uh, various projects. That's part of my theme, to introduce the kinds of things the Darwin Initiative has supported. And um, I'll move on then to talk about how it's evolved since its beginning, because it's changed a lot, in fact and also how you can all get involved uh, in the Darwin Initiative, and a little bit at the end about what the future of the initiative may look like. Now, as I can still recall as vividly as though it was yesterday, and I'm sure that's true for quite a few of, the, of you in the room, um, the starting point for the Darwin Initiative was the Earth Summit. Sorry? That's a good idea. 
um, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> A little bit more than that. I'm going to be quite dependent on some notes in this as I'm going to try and get some facts and figures about some people's projects. Right? If, if, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. I think. Yeah. We need to get it so Sam can sleep quietly at the back <laughs> and I can read my notes. I will get my glasses ready. That's too dark, though. Sorry. So that's upstairs, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's leave it. That's a good compromise. Um, so, as I say, I can well remember the excitement that came around 1992 with the Rio summit, and an expectation of all manner of exciting things in the world of biodiversity. Um, and really, the word was quite fresh and new, and everything was very exciting at that time. And where was it going to take us? Um, I think it's a very open question as to uh, where the convention has taken us. And that's for another day, maybe. But one of the best things of all that happened during that Earth Summit was that was an announcement of a new initiative. The Prime Minister of the day, who was John Major, of course, um, had announced that the UK will have a Darwin Initiative, and the Darwin Initiative for the Survival of Species, it was called, and it was going to be the UK committing to doing something in response to this new convention. And myself and colleagues at the Natural History Museum, as it was at that time, were very excited that essentially we thought this means us, and this is an opportunity, and this is really going to be important. Um, we were perhaps partly right about that, I don't know. But one of the things I think it undoubtedly did at that time was to establish the UK as one of the countries that has really engaged very closely with the Biodiversity Convention. And actually being first with a really good practical initiative was important. And I'm pleased to say that I think that the UK is one of the countries that's still been more engaged than others in the, in the Biodiversity Convention. And I think that's important that we should be a leading country engaged in it. Because if you think about the resources of wealth of biodiversity information we have in this country really is extraordinary and the reason for existence of this society of course but amazing collections expertise focused on those collections and really a lot to contribute around the world well when the initiative was launched uh, Sir Crispin Tickell was appointed to be its first chairman uh, for those of you who don't recognise him that's Crispin there, looking regal in the rainforest of Belize. Crispin, it's easy to forget now, and maybe younger members of the audience may not know, but Crispin played a hugely important role in Britain in terms of opening the eyes of government to understanding the importance of global change, and in particular, impressing on Margaret Thatcher when she was Prime Minister that climate change was real and something that needed to be thought about. Um, I think we often forget the role he played in the mix at that time these days, but uh, really a very, very influential person. Somebody I was really pleased to get to know personally because he was on the board of trustees at uh, the Natural History Museum, and then when I moved to Edinburgh I found that he was on the board of trustees there as well. So one of those people that you will meet in many different places. And perhaps the best meeting of all was this time when we went to uh, Belize together and um, I've always felt that Crispin in a way defines the meaning of the word gravitas I mean look at him showing how to wear a boa constrictor the star <laughs> that's how it's done um, wonderful man and as a little bit of an aside I did promise somebody but I've forgotten who it was I would sneak in a picture of a boa constrictor randomly to this talk and I've just done it <laughs> with that one and the background and reason to that was an exchange about binomial names and a challenge to try and think how many things have the same common name in English as their scientific names. And so boa constrictor is one of them. So I've achieved one of my objectives tonight. I've smuggled in a picture of Crispin with a snake around his neck. And actually, I think another one would be that I'm pretty sure that's the top of Sandy Knapp's head in the background there. So that, that scores extra points too, yeah. doesn't it, certainly? <laughs> Um, so Crispin was the first chairman, and he did an outstanding job um, leading the, the Darwin Initiative for the first period until uh, 1999. The chairmanship then passed over to 
David Ingram, who was the Regis Keeper in the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh. And um, I was his successor, of course, so when David retired from the garden in 1999, I went there to take that post. And I must admit, even in the back of my mind then, I had a little notion that perhaps one day when I have to retire, I think I'll, I'll do that. So if David were here, he would realise that I've been following him around in various things that he's done over the years. But he too was an outstanding chairman. Um, and uh, in 2005, he handed over to Professor David MacDonald of Oxford University's Wildlife Conservation and Research Unit. Um, and um, has, he was the chair until just last year when I succeeded and, uh, him. And in conversation with David of what it involved, um, it wasn't compulsory to interview meerkats, but all sorts of other challenging things would be required, I understood. And uh, I think, you know, he had done a great job. And uh, my summary, looking back on those three chairmen, is that there's uh, big shoes and a lot of expectations taking it on. Uh, really quite a challenge for me. Well, to move on to the early evolution of the Darwin Initiative, and I'm really helped in this, that there's in fact a brochure you can download off the internet called The Evolution of the Darwin Initiative. I'm going to show you quite a few of these, and I know you can't read them, so you don't need to try. Um, looking at the pictures is allowed, and then one or two have enlarged some text, or I'll tell you what it actually says. But a point I wanted to make at this stage is just to say that on the Darwin Initiative's website, uh, you can find a huge amount of printed and non-printed PDF uh, literature about the initiative and um, there's some really fabulous stuff available there. Um, and the point I wanted to highlight about this is simply that in this document it, it recaps on the fact that the initiative was announced in 1992 at the Earth Summit and it describes what I've called in my title the simple formula. I realised afterwards my simple formula sounded like a rather corny advert for washing powder or something uh, with this simple formula of amazing impact. Um, you can see I'm a failed advertising executive. It wouldn't really have been any use. But the key principle really was drawing on expertise from within the United Kingdom to work with partners in countries rich in biodiversity but poor in resources to achieve the objectives of the Biodiversity Convention. And the words and language used in this following part are directly from the convention itself. And that uh, mix of UK expertise, partners in other countries, biodiversity rich countries, that was the initial formula that I think made the Darwin Initiative special. And it's changed and moved on. And I'll come back to how it's evolved later. But now I think I'm going to illustrate the amazing impact by talking about two projects that I was personally involved in through the Darwin Initiative, both of which were uh, botanical projects focused on Nepal. And for me, I've picked them out as examples to tell you about, because unlike so many other wonderful projects, I know these ones. Um, they're not special in any other way other than my familiarity. But what I'd like to do is bring out some of the things that happened during these projects and to use them as a sort of illustration of the types of wonderful things that go on in Darwin Initiative projects. So when I was Keeper of Botany at the Natural History Museum, I got frequent requests from botanists in Nepal writing to ask for um, one of two things, either um, duplicate herbarium specimens or publications of information about Nepal because the Natural History Museum has one of the world's most important holdings and collections of Nepalese plants. And as is the way with botanists, those had been collected in multiple sets and there had been duplicates, but the duplicates, again, as often happens, have been distributed almost everywhere except back to Nepal. So there was a dearth of plant material for identification in Nepal. And basically, several Nepalese people came to me and said, um, can we help? Would we be able to do something to, uh, to get access to the information held in UK collections back to Nepal? And so at the start of that project, four Nepalese botanists were involved. Um, Krishna Shrestha, who's here, 
was appointed as a Darwin Fellow and spent quite a large part of time uh, between 97 and 99 with us in London working on the project. And there were three other Darwin scholars, one of whom I'm delighted to say is here with us this evening and will appear in a picture in a moment. Um, and the project really did have amazing impact. What we did was we took the published work on the checklist of Nepal, which had been done um, by, amongst others, by William Stern, who was, of course, past president of the Linnaean Society. He published a three-volume enumeration of the flowering plants of Nepal between 1978 and 1982. But it was already very out of date. And what we decided to do was create a database of the checklist and to digitise images of herbarium specimens. And nowadays that's a very routine thing to do, but at the time I think this is probably one of the first projects that began to use digital images to mobilise information as a substitute for being able to provide duplicate specimens. And as I say, four botanists came from Nepal and uh, worked on that project. But the impact in Nepal went way beyond just the delivery of the CD, which is what it was in those days. It wasn't even an online resource. I think the information is online now, but at that time what you did was you gave a CD containing the database. And for people in Nepal who hadn't got access to the right software, that was provided too. So we were able to deliver the information, but that is not really sufficient to make anything terribly important happening. And in 1997, I went to this workshop in Kathmandu, um, and actually Sangeeta and I are both in that photograph somewhere, and uh, there was, this was to discuss the idea of producing a flora of Nepal, and um, as one of the few countries in the world actually it doesn't have a modern flora. And it was realised in this conference and workshop that although there were quite a few botanists from Britain, a number from the United States, and plenty from Japan, uh, there were relatively few Nepalese botanists who could write accounts for the flora. And it was a matter of national pride, I think, very understandably, that um, people in Nepal wanted to be engaged in writing their own flora. So we conceived of a second project um, and put that forward, the Darwin Initiative, and, um, and we were successful. And just to show you a few pictures of this project, which ran from 2002 to 2005, here the focus was not at all on CDs and databases, it was on human beings, because what we realised would make the biggest difference in Nepal would be to train a really strong cadre of well-trained plant taxonomists. And the focus was to do two things. One was to get people to be able to write floristic accounts, but the other was to go in the field and to assess the status of plants using the red listing approach, because virtually nothing was known about the status of, of wild plant species except for the, the most familiar ones in Nepal. And just to point out that you know, the man launching the session is none other than Krishna Shrestha, who having been a Darwin fellow then, had a more prominent role back home. And next to him is um, the head of what was then the Royal the Royal Nepal Academy of Science and Technology, the Royal Bit is no longer there, the Minister of the Environment and the then British Ambassador. And I want to make the point that in every Darwin project I hear about, the level of political connection in countries around the world is really quite remarkable and, uh, and an important ingredient in itself. So we focused on Going back to the basics and training people, there were 12 Darwin scholars recruited for this. Um, we, we received CVs and we selected them here in the UK. Um, we asked for the youngest members we could get from the various institutions putting them forward, and it was quite an interesting mixture of ages, in fact, but one or two of them were not quite as young as I am. And, uh, but nevertheless, it was a great mix. So here's everybody at a final workshop standing outside what by then was simply the Nepal Academy of Sciences and Technology building at our, at our final um, workshop. And what I want to do is just to show you what to happen to one or two of those people in terms of the kind of legacy and personal impact of 
what I think is a fairly typical Darwin project, because Darwin projects really <coughs> are transformational for the people involved in them. So if I stick some labels and tell you about a few people, um, I could start with uh, Ram Pudel, who was, um, he was called a freelancer. It meant he didn't have a job of any kind, but dead keen to become a botanist, and he joined up as one of the Darwin scholars. But such a bright young man that later he got a Darwin Fellowship and he did his PhD, sorry, his Masters in, in the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh. And went on to do a PhD at the Kunming Institute of Botany in, in China and is back in Nepal now and a talented man who I'm sure will do amazing things. Sangeeta Rajbandari, I'm delighted, is with us tonight. And Sangeeta had been involved in both of the two projects and... Um, as a Darwin scholar, then as a Darwin fellow. She went on to do a PhD at home in Tribhuvan University in Nepal, but she's currently, as a postdoc, visiting the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh and carrying out her higher level of research. Krishna Shrestha, who was in both projects again, was for a spell the head of department of botany at Tribhuvan University and undoubtedly one of Nepal's um, most highly regarded botanical professors. It's a two-way process, I'd like to emphasise. So Mark Watson, who led the second project in practical terms from Edinburgh, also gained the promotion and um, rose up to be head of floristics in our research team in Edinburgh. Um, final one that I'm going to mention is Vasco Adhikari, who was involved in the second of these two projects. But he later had a Darwin Fellowship and completed his PhD as a Darwin Fellow in Edinburgh. And actually, he's currently with us at the moment, working as a postdoc and a truly brilliant scientist um, who can tackle monographic work on the genus Berberus. And anyone who can do that is a very special person indeed. So there were others, actually, who came back as Darwin Fellows. So really, I'm just trying to bring out the human stories of some of the people, um, of, 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 of how they were changed. And perhaps best of all, of course, there is now a flora of Nepal that's coming out in ten volumes. The first one's printed, two more are on their way. And as I say, it's transformational for people. Here's Mark Watson. Um, you can see he's become a much better person for the Darwin Project. And uh, that just shows a, a mere part of, uh, of, of the, the, the benefits of these projects. I think he's still in Nepal, or he may be back in the day. He's back, is he? Um, I knew there would be people who'd know. There's going to be people who know the answers to all the bits of this that I don't. Um, but he, he'd been staying with the ambassador. He's moved in, I think. And um, all sorts of really wonderful spin-off projects are coming out from the knowledge from the flora, such as illustrated guides that trekkers will take with them um, as part of the ecotourism business, which is so vital in Nepal. So wonderful things. Anyway, that's my examples out of the way. And I'm going to come on now to telling you about the recent developments and how it's changed since uh, origins in 1992 and what's going on in the, um, in the Darwin Initiative now. And I'll try to do that in a way that shows you the diversity of the projects and the people who've been involved, not just the, um, not just the projects I know about in Nepal. Um, and it's not really surprising that the, the Darwin Initiative has evolved and changed. It's very different today from what it was in 1992 and 1993 when it got going. Um, because really the convention itself has also moved on. If you think of the initial focus when the Biodiversity Convention came in, it was very much concerned with access to um, the genetic resources of plants and sustainable uh, share the sustainable use of plants and sharing equitable sharing of the benefits from that kind of genetic diversity aspect with a very strong focus reflecting an expectation of that time that biotechnology might really take off in a big way and much much less focused on conservation than one might have liked or one might have imagined so the convention has changed um, and come a long way and as it's changed so has the um, the Darwin Initiative. So this is another of those wonderful brochures that you can download offline, and again, which I don't expect you to read, but it signals the point of time when <coughs> the Darwin Initiative wanted to draw out how it was contributing to the 2010 biodiversity target. And um, so it used case studies to show how it was going to be doing that. 
And probably everybody knows that the ultimate objective of the 2010 target was um, halting the decline of the loss of biodiversity, which is something which, sadly, of course, we all know, hasn't happened. And if anything is more pressing and urgent than it was even then. But uh, that was the emphasis at that time. But one of the statements that you could have read if you saw the correct page of this brochure is that uh, an opinion that I think, um, I have a sneaking suspicion that perhaps this was an opinion I'd written, but if not, it's identical to my feeling about it that when it says that it's likely that the initiative has had a disproportionate impact for its budget when compared to some other funding sources such as the GEF. And for those of you who may not know the acronym, that's the Global Environment Facility, which is probably the main financial mechanism coming through the World Bank uh, tied to the Biodiversity Convention. Projects can be very, very much bigger. Um, a large Darwin project is about £300,000, and the more typical one somewhere between two and 300000 that's a lot of money, of course, but it's not big in terms of international projects. And yet, the impact has definitely been picked out as being disproportionate. And if I move on again uh, now, having made that point about the value for money, as it were, um, to the 20th anniversary of the Rio Convention, the Rio Plus 20 meeting, um, which I think was a bit of a shock to the system for people around the world and realising in some ways how little had changed about the fundamental status of biodiversity since the origins of the convention. Uh, you know, what I think it demonstrates is that important though they are, it isn't conventions that make the things happen and change. That requires initiatives and it requires people, the point I was trying to emphasise before. Well, these examples I'll show you now come from a brochure that was celebrating 20 years of the Darwin Initiative as well as 20 years of the Biodiversity Convention. And at the Rio um, Plus 20 meeting, rather than talking about the articles of the convention in its original rather legalistic language, there was a move to connect with issues that people might understand really mattered in the world. And this document shows the relationship between those important issues and what the Darwin Initiative sets out to do. And um, I'm going to show you some examples from the actual brochure itself in a moment. But uh, one important change that I'll highlight out of this document is that by the time the review was produced after 20 years, the Darwin Initiative was not just supporting one convention, it was supporting three because, as it says in here, um, well, actually the figures of the funding are pretty impressive. So since 1992, the Darwin Initiative at that point had provided over £88 million to 750 projects in 150 countries, which is an extraordinary diversity of projects. I can't possibly do justice to those tonight. But it was expanded in 2008, critically, to include the Convention on Trade in Endangered Species CITES and the Convention on Migratory Species. And that's actually quite a significant stretching and change from the original objectives. But to me, an entirely natural and sensible one, because that family of three UN conventions are now regarded basically as the three um, biodiversity conventions dealing with different components and different aspects. So that was an important change. Um, I'll update you on the funding in a minute, but um, because those figures are now out of date, but I was going to do that by just saying that out of that number of projects and that scale of funding, the diversity of projects has increased. Then there's not a single model Darwin project anymore. They're very, very wide and very different. And all I did in this picture was to cull from various of the newsletters a range of pictures of projects from Mali, Madagascar, uh, Benin, not sure, oh, St. Helena, um, wide range of countries, wide range of activities, um, and wide range of techniques being applied. If you're wondering what's going on here, they're electrocuting fish that are invasive species in a river in Nigeria. So a remarkable diversity of things supported by the Darwin Initiative. 
And I really would encourage you, if you'd like to know more, look at the website and download those newsletters and sign up for the mailing list because they really are inspiring newsletters. So the funding to date now has in fact exceeded £100 million and there have been about, and it's still an approximate figure, uh, 850 projects in 157 countries. It ceased to be an approximate figure about 48 hours ago when the list of projects funded in 2013 and 14 was finally published on the website. So if you were to look on the DEFRA website at the moment, you'll see the full list of recently funded projects. And uh, I put in 850 as a guess, and I think I'm right, but I haven't gone back to check it. So, significant in its outreach and in its number of projects, which is why, actually, I'm surprised that in this room, although there was quite a large um, number of hands went up, there weren't even more. I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot of projects. So, I'll move on, though, uh, because further changes have happened, and this is perhaps the most significant one of all, because the funding for the Darwin Initiative no longer comes simply from DEFRA, as it did in the early days. DEFRA still have the lead on managing um, the, the, the initiative, the, the Secretariat team that I work with come from DEFRA. But now it has funding from three departments of government. It's funded by DEFRA, DFID, the Department for International Development, and also the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And in fact, as you can see, the majority of the funds, uh, five million pounds per annum, compared to DEFRA's one million, the majority is coming from DFID now uh, into the general pot of money for the Darwin projects. And there's a second strand, which I'm going to come back to in a moment, of what is called Darwin Plus, which provides funding for the UK overseas territories. And there the mix is about two million pounds in each annual round, but a million pounds of that coming from DEFRA and five, half a million each from um, Foreign and Commonwealth Office and DFID. So the money sources have changed and um, it's an incredibly fortunate situation that DFID was able to come in. It's quite likely that the Darwin Initiative would just have ended uh, given the financial pressures that there are on DEFRA's budget and its ability to keep going with an initiative of this scale. Um, I think it's also healthy to see that what this also reflects is that more departments of government see the importance of the set of interconnected issues that the Darwin Initiative has been working on. They understand that biodiversity isn't treated in isolation from climate change or poverty alleviation or food security or water or any of these other major issues of the day. And it represents a coalition of three departments in government now seeing the significance of this kind of work. And in that sense, I think, it's an extremely positive thing. I'm going to go back to that Rio Plus 20 brochure now, and I'm going to show you um, the, the issues that were pulled out at that time. And, and uh, it, as I say, it's very convenient that these documents exist because they allow me to pick out some projects that will really showcase the variety of things that the initiative has done. So the first issue, and they moved away from the technical jargon towards simple issues people would understand. The first issue was jobs. Green jobs and social inclusion as a theme in, in Rio at that time. And um, the example of the project that was picked out and relates to that is focused on the sustainable harvesting in Bhutan of cordyceps, which um, I'm not sure if people will be familiar with these things, but they are a half, half made up of a caterpillar and a half of the fungus that ultimately kills the caterpillar. And um, in China, I think their name literally means half plant, half animal. We'll skip over whether fungi are plants or not for now. But um, anything as mysterious as that is bound to be a wonderfully important medicine. And these things have huge value uh, in, in, the, in the traditional medicine trade in China, Bhutan, Nepal, and several countries neighboring. Um, I've, because I've worked quite a lot in China, I've seen them being harvested in the field and uh, set myself the challenge, since you know, naturalists should be good at finding things, of finding one myself, and I've never been able to do that. They're practically invisible. You just see the little fruiting body of the fungus sticking up out of the ground. Anyway, there they are. Um, a farmer I met personally in China told me that um, their farm 
the, their annual income, the two months during which they could harvest these, produced several times more money than the farm did for the rest of the year, which I thought was interesting. Um, but there was a project led by Paul Cannon at the Commonwealth Mycological Institute working with two organisations in Bhutan. Um, one focused on renewable natural resources such as this and the other on biotechnology. And I'm going to mention in these next few examples who the lead person on the project was and, and the kind of agencies they were working with. Because again, to illustrate that mix I think is quite interesting and important. Um, the next case study there focused on energy and on sustainable energy for all. And you might not be thrilled to think about charcoal as a source of energy. Personally, I can think of better things to do with trees, leaving them there. But the fact is that um, wood for cooking and charcoal for cooking are a vital resource for people in so many countries around the world. And the projects focused in on better ways of doing that. And in this particular case, the the, um, the project that was used in the case study was led by William Milliken at Q, with no less than seven different partners in Peru. There are two mentioned here, actually, and it's the, the picture is from Peru. Um, he had a range of partners from two universities, NGOs, and a, a museum. And this is also a typical thing in, in uh, Darwin projects, that quite a broad range of institutions in, in the sort of host country will be involved, um, in, and very often including NGOs, an important project. The next issue was cities, and I think we all know that we are ourselves now a species that is mostly found in cities. Um, more than half of humanity now lives in cities. I found myself thinking, you, some of you know that David MacDonald made a wonderful wildlife series about the urban fox and how foxes thrive in cities. It was a brilliant program, if you've never seen it. And, uh, well, we're like foxes. We, we seem to thrive mainly in cities these days. And a huge challenge for the future is how will we make sustainable cities? What is this transition meaning of people moving into ever bigger and bigger cities? So quite a few projects have, have focused um, in that whole area. The case study that was used here also highlights another feature of the Darwin Initiative. It was training um, taxonomists in Cambodia uh, on the first MSc course to be introduced there to take people to that level in taxonomy. And the Darwin Initiative has actually been very good in getting into countries like Cambodia where the past recent history had been, to say the least, pretty appalling, and opportunities for training in such fields had been non-existent. And the Darwin Initiative had actually been really rather good at doing that. Um, the person in the picture is studying bats, but one of the MSc students. Diversity of creatures and plant studies is amazing, but um, that was focused on development in, in uh, Cambodia. Food security, of course, is also universally recognised now as one of the major issues of our time for the future. And um, the example here is an interesting one too, and it illustrates something else about the Darwin Initiative. It concerned um, forestry and agroforestry in the Comoro Islands in the Indian Ocean. And uh, the interesting ingredient though is that the technique that was being introduced there, previously not practiced locally, was of <coughs> growing nitrogen fixing trees, small trees in amongst the crops, which is something that's been done in many parts of the world, including um, in Brazil and in Madagascar. And with the Darwin Initiative actually having been involved in the transfer of that technology and approach between several of those countries. So sharing of experience between countries and regions has been a feature of Darwin projects too. That project was led by Neil Madison of the Bristol Conservation Science Foundation, working with the government of the Comoro Islands and with local NGOs and organisations. I forgot to say, by the way, that the um, Cambodian one was led by Neil Fury and Fauna and Fora International, um, working with the Royal University of Phnom Penh. I've skipped over that detail by mistake. 
I'm sure that you would know that water is going to be one of the issues that would be on a list like this. And the case study there was another project in Nepal. This is a rather different one from the ones I was involved in. Um, this project led by Seb Buckton of the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. By the way, if anybody I mentioned is here, I know some of those names, but not all. Do say hello afterwards. I'd love to meet you and be corrected on how to pronounce your names correctly. Um, he worked uh, with five different organisations in Nepal on this project, and um, they included Tripovan University, but also Bird Conservation Nepal and IUCN Nepal focusing on, um, on livelihoods dependent on freshwater fishes, but also on um, the protection of watersheds. And an increasing number of Darwin projects, I think, have picked out water and the sustainable water supply. Um, I'm nearly at the end of this rather long list, but oceans, too, are, of course, incredibly important in terms of sustainable fisheries and the management of fisheries. And in fact, it seems to me that quite a significant proportion of recent projects have been marine projects funded by the initiative. So there's a good balance between terrestrial and marine projects in the funding mix. Um, this one was again in the Indian Ocean, this time focused on the island of Rodriguez in, in Mauritius, and um, was led by Alistair Edwards of Newcastle University, working together with three mainly governmental but also non-governmental organisations in, in Mauritius. Um, and it led to the formal um, registration of marine protected areas, which has been such an important thing happening around the world to actually protect fish stocks so they're not totally over-exploited. The final one of these from that 2020 brochure concerns disasters. And it's interesting because by their nature you can't plan for them. But one of the things that the Darwin Initiative has tried to do has been very flexible in directing money fairly promptly to emerging issues and things that arise. Another reason why it's changed through time. And in this case, um, while a project was being prepared for the Cayman Islands by um, Brendan Godley at the University of Exeter, uh, Hurricane Ivan struck the Cayman Islands in 2004 and they switched the focus of their um, project responding to requests from local government and focused instead on a biodiversity assessment that would lead to a biodiversity management plan which hadn't previously existed there. Mm -hmm. And um, that flexibility is also a key ingredient. Um, not easily done. Now, mentioning the Cayman Islands in this final example um, reminds me that I wanted to say a little bit more about Darwin Plus, which was launched in October 2012 <coughs> as Darwin Plus Overseas Territories Environment and Climate Fund. And again, it formally embraces climate projects and it focuses on the 14 UK overseas territories. Territories which um, have history in common, if not biogeography, but they are extraordinarily rich places in their biodiversity, mostly small islands, and such places, of course, being high in endemism and um, vulnerable to threats to their biodiversity. So it's particularly pleasing that there is a focus on the uh, UK overseas territories because it's quite remarkable how. Uh, underpopulated, let's say, many of them are, and how much there's a need even to develop some very basic things like adequate waste disposal, which is always a challenge for small island communities, but is one of the pressures on, on their natural resources. I would like, during my term of office, to take my deck chair and put it on every one of these islands. <laughs> um, I don't think it's going to happen. I have actually been to the um, British military base in Tequilia because my father worked in Cyprus and luckily for him he actually managed to tick off Ascension Island as well, he worked there for a year or so and I got quite close in that when I first went to Aldabra in the Indian Ocean that had just been handed over and was part of the British Indian Ocean Territory but no longer is, it's now part of Seychelles. But it's an extraordinary um, thought that the UK is responsible for such diverse places around the world 
and I was really, I'm really pleased that the Darwin Plus continues and, um, and has resources available for the projects that come forward focused on those places. I want to mention two really important consequences of DFID now being the major funding source for the Darwin Initiative. And actually, this goes straight to what I have found have been the most common frequently asked questions since I took over chairing the committee, because um, there's some fundamental changes in principles involved. And this is simply from DFID's official website in terms of their description of what they do and how the UK aid logo should be used. But essentially it's important to remember that DFID funding counts as what is called Overseas Development Assistance, ODA. And in line with DFID's primary purpose, that has to be directed towards poorer nations. So the qualification of biodiversity rich places is not necessarily involved here. Um, and that's defined technically actually as lower and lower middle income countries of which there is an international table that you can look up. Um, secondly, and very significantly, at that time, because this is British aid money, the restriction on applications originating from the UK ended because overseas aid money is available to worthy applicants from around the world. So one of the most dramatic changes in the Darwin Initiative in the past couple of years has been opening up to uh, anybody, anywhere in the world, to propose a project. It must have that same interaction and partnership but it no longer needs to involve any organisations in the UK. And of course, that's been much lamented by the organisations here who have traditionally benefited. But I think it's been interesting in that seeing applications coming in from around the world, um, it has stretched and magnified the importance of the Darwin Initiative in, in a really quite remarkable way. The other thing it's done, I have to say, though, is made the work of the committee that I chair extremely challenging because the number of projects that each committee member has to review is growing quite dramatically and um, we'll, when we start our next round we'll be going into the third year in which we've had that scale of fund, that uh, open competition and it's going to be, I anticipate, even more projects from around the world. So that's very different. Um, I want, I've, this is a rather odd slide to include isn't it? But, it's really important to highlight the impact of that on designing a Darwin application. And really now I'm speaking to the get involved part of my talk because the main way you can become involved in the Darwin Initiative is setting up a project and applying to it. But it matters fundamentally that the work should uh, on support um, benefit people in low or middle income countries. Um, if it doesn't, it's still possible to seek funding from DEFRA but there are now two distinct application streams and the DEFRA pot of funding is, is, is significantly smaller. So um, that is a really important diagram from the guidance notes that were issued in the last round. And if I could give any advice at all to people thinking of projects, I would say spend a huge amount of time looking at the guidance that's issued. It's drawn up by um, uh, the DEFRA and Secretariat and by LTS International and it's available from both of those organisations because the biggest mistake that we see when reviewing proposals is people who basically you would sit there saying well they didn't read the information and it changes every single year so when the next guidance comes out it's critically important to, to read it and then apart from the else diagrams like this navigate through the different streams of funding from Darwin Fellowships scoping projects, UK overseas territories and the main round of funding and, um, and so you can carefully follow the instructions as it were to, to get to the right part. We've realised looking ahead to the next round which will probably be announced in May, haven't got an exact date for that yet, that competition will be even fiercer and the committee have decided that to spare the efforts of the um, reviewers Projects will simply be rejected if they fail to conform to the request and the past we've been quite lenient and looked at them anyway. Um, so even getting the word count right is important. It's funny, boxes with 50 words please and then you get four pages. That, that will actually lead to um, instant failure, which is tough. Um, 
Another way of getting involved I would like you to, to think about, I know you can't read this, some of you may be able to, but that's the list of people on the committee. It's an incredible privilege for me to chair such a high-powered and well-qualified committee of scientists. And um, there is some turnover coming up, and so if you're interested in coming on the committee, watch this space, because on the DEFRA website later in the year, I'm expecting that they will go through yet another recruitment process. So if you're a glutton for punishment and you really like reviewing projects, do think about it. It's incredibly rewarding and very worthwhile. Um, no fixed date for when that will be announced, but it is likely to happen soon. I should just say that this committee, which I chair, is not the final decision maker. It makes recommendations to ministers. Ministers then decide what to, what to support. So um, what we do is we rank projects and we, we identify the priorities. So coming towards the end now, I'm going to move a little bit to the future, where I won't have a lot to say, partly because I can't tell you very much about what the future will be like. But I do expect that the impact of the Darwin Initiative and its prestige will continue to grow in the years ahead, as it has since 1992. Um, it's obviously important that we get continued investment from three government departments and that's something which um, we'll work hard to maintain and to grow if at all possible. And the key thing though is good projects coming in are worthy of support, ones the ministers couldn't possibly decline. And think about all three conventions in relation to that. It's, it's a fact that relatively few address CITES, for example, and relatively few the Migratory Species Convention. Um, in round 20, the reason I, why I put this picture of the London Conference on the Illegal Wildlife Trade was in round 20, <coughs> as an innovation, there was a, a suggested theme that not every project had to have, but there was a welcome to projects addressing the challenges of the illegal wildlife trade. And that thematic approach is likely to continue, although at this stage, next year's theme hasn't been determined. Um, it's quite likely, however, that it might relate to access and benefit sharing in light of the fact that the Nagoya Protocol comes into effect. And so projects focusing on capacity building in relation to access and benefit sharing are welcomed. It doesn't mean that they'll be given special privileged treatment, they're not. They'll be in the same fierce peer review that all projects get. But it's likely that'll be something that the ministers are looking to support in relation to the business of the Biodiversity Convention as it moves along. So really, uh, and this is my last slide now, to draw some conclusions, I hope you'll agree that the Darwin Initiative has made a very significant contribution to all three of those biodiversity-related conventions. And it's done that in an extremely cost-effective way. It adds up to a big number now, 100 million pounds, but the scale of the projects really is, is small as individual projects. And I think that um, very effective model, this formula, is one that could well be replicated in other countries and other major funders focused on biodiversity convention. One of the things I'd really like to try to do during my time is to see if we can interest others in funding in a similar mode. One thing that's happened since we opened up to applications from around the world is that um, there are more and more South-South partnerships. Now you no longer need to have a partner in the UK. And so the diversity and range of projects is changing and the partnerships are changing. But each of those still has to have that bringing together of expertise and need that has been there right since the beginning. So um, on International Biodiversity Day in May, is it the 28th? I didn't write that down, um, is the most likely date for the announcement of the next round, the 21st round of the Darwin Initiative, so look out for it and get excited and send in your applications. And I'll just close now by thanking both the Systematics Association and the Linnaean Society for the opportunity to come and tell you about this initiative tonight, and um, I will endeavour to answer any questions. I may not know the answer, but I'm happy to try. Thank you.